How do you find a POTA activator's location if they're using FT8? Does antenna location matter geographically? And why would your FT8 power change if you change bands? Let's find out this time on Mailbag Monday. What is happening, everyone? Thanks for tuning in to another episode of KMRD Radio Stuff. My name is Mike. If you have an amateur radio-related question for me, shoot me an email, kmrd at icloud.com, and you may have your question featured on an episode of Mailbag Monday. Guys, we got some great questions for you today, so let's dive right in. This first question has to do with FT8 and POTA. Uh, this viewer is writing, is there a way to tell where a POTA station is located when I work them on FT8 or FT4? Example, I recently worked KI5HBS on 20 meter FT8 in Echo Mike 63. A quick check of the POTA website revealed that the station had not been recently spotted. As a matter of fact, his last activation showed to be several days ago. I looked up that grid uh, that was given via our contact, and there seemed to be at least a couple of parks that he could be operating from. Short of emailing KI5HBS to find out his location, is there any other way to easily find out his location and the park he was operating from so good question uh it can be challenging on ft8 because we're not really uh transmitting all of that information like we would uh on single sideband or or cw even so uh if you're into instant gratification if they're not spotted uh there's not going to be any real easy way to know where they're from unless uh you just sit there and wait to see if they're spotted or you wait until after the activation, uh, you know, maybe a day or two later, whatever, you, you'll, you might have to keep checking back. But the answer is on the Parks on the Air website. So let's hop over there. So if we go over to Parks on the Air website, you want to make sure you're logged in. And then we can go down here to My Hunter Log. Now, here is every single person that I've ever hunted. So if I wanted to search a particular operator, so let's just say KE8PZN because he's right at the top and I just worked him. He was at a twofer. Uh, whoops, and you spell it right. Here you can see all of the contacts that I've had with James. Now, just the other day on the second, he was at a twofer in Florida and I worked him from Huntsville State Park. And here's the information right here. So he was at 1848 Colt Creek State Park and uh, Kilo 5330 Green Swamp Wilderness Park Reserve. So that would be a way for you to find out what park he was at and just in general to find out what park anyone is at because this is your entire hunted log. As soon as the hunter uh, uh, enters their log or uploads their log to the POTA website, your contact will be in there. So great question. Hopefully we all learned a little something from this and thanks for being a hunter. We appreciate it. Next, we have a question on antennas and geography, two of everybody's favorite subjects, right? This viewer is asking, I saw your YouTube channel and videos where you often deploy an NFED half-wave antenna for pod activations. I'd like to gift my father an NFED half-wave antenna for him to use at home since he currently only has a 20-meter dipole. Unfortunately, he doesn't have an analyzer available, and I'm several hours away. Can I tune, trim the radiating element here and send the whole unit off to him to deploy at home? Uh, will the trim job here be valid there? Does he need to duplicate the height angle I used uh, here when trimming? I figure you'd be an excellent person to ask since deploying for POTA doesn't always guarantee the same set of parameters each time, uh, and you seem to have great, uh, great success. <laughs> uh, so that's a good question, and, and I'll tell you, in, in my humble experience, it doesn't really matter that much. Now, you got to think, there's antenna manufacturers that make antennas and sell them. T totally tuned and trimmed and cut and ready to go. Uh, generally, they're going to have some suggested ways of deploying. So, for example, the uh, Nelson antenna that's above my house right now, I have configured in a way that he does not suggest. <laughs> he suggests having the feed point low to the ground and uh, sloping up. That's just not an option at my house. So there, there was a little bit of a discrepancy in the SWR, but uh, not enough to really matter. Uh, now, I have uh, had the privilege of, of traveling quite a bit and uh, living in many states and, and traveling to many states. And so, for example, the Pactenna NFED half wave is going to be an antenna that I'm that I'm going to pretty much travel with anywhere I go because it's just so darn tiny and portable. So I started with that antenna in Michigan. Okay, 
Then I moved down to Texas. Same antenna, same wire, same everything. No problems. I've taken it to Arizona and used it at the Grand Canyon. No problems. I also use it in several different configurations depending on what's around me. Terrain, trees, whatever. Or just maybe I don't want to extend all 66 feet. So I, I have mine as a linked end fed half wave. So I might disconnect the, the, the element that lengthens it for 40 meters. And I'll only run with, say, the 20 meter element or the 17 meter element. And I, I might run it just as a vertical with the transformer pretty much sitting on the ground with a 10 meter mast. Uh, so as a vertical, as a sloper, which I generally run it at. Uh, sometimes I've done an inverted V. Uh, I've done all kinds of configurations over all kinds of different ground conditions in all kinds of different states. Does the SWR change a little bit? Yeah, but there's so many different factors that could affect that, and it's, it's, it's always been pretty negligible. So I would say you'd be very fine in making this antenna for your dad and sending it off to him and saying, here you go, Pops, get on the air, and uh, now you can have, you know, four bands or all the bands or, or whatever you cut it for now. One thing you might want to do, figure out uh, maybe before you make the antenna, if you can reproduce, uh, you know, or find the ideal uh, setup for the antenna at his house, cut the antenna at your house, make it in those same conditions, and that way you're eliminating as many variables as possible. So if he can if he can put it up really high and you have the ability to do that too, do it. If you're gonna run it as a sloper with the transformer closer to the ground and, and the end of the antenna higher up, do that. The, the more uh, similar the situation is, the better your results are going to be. But even if, it, even if that's not the case, in, in my experience with uh, however many NFED half waves that I own, uh, it, it's not really going to matter at all. So great question. That's awesome. You want to make your dad an antenna and uh, hopefully you can make one for 80 meters so you can get all the bands. That'd be awesome. 136 feet or so. So, hey, thanks so much for writing in. I appreciate it. It's a good question. This last question is a really good one and one that I covered in my video uh, in getting started with FT8, but I think it's worth mentioning here again. Uh, this viewer is asking, uh, he's got a question related to FT8, he's telling us about what he runs, and he noticed uh, with his radio set to 65 watts, hardly any SWR, that I push out around 65 watts on the meter, which I read off my SWR meter. However, things change when I switch bands. I noticed this. Uh, I, I, I noticed I was I was running 10 meters, and I reached South Africa. That is logged in QRZ. Anyway, I noticed my wattage has dropped, and it's running about 10 watts or so. So you got South Africa on 10 watts. That's pretty awesome. Uh, but I'm still showing hardly any SWR. Where the heck did my wattage go? And do I have something set up in the program that is causing this, or is it normal that wattage changes as you change bands? So very easy fix, and uh, kind of once you do this, you, you shouldn't really have to muck with it. It has nothing to do with your SWR. It has nothing to do with your radio, sort of. It has everything to do with what we want to do as a general practice every time you change bands. But as you change bands, you shouldn't have to do this more often. But it is a setting in WSJTX, so let's hop over and take a look. Okay, so you can see the radio at the bottom left-hand corner of your screen. And if we take a look at the power meter, I'm on 20 meters right now. I've got the radio set to 50% uh, here. You can see on the top right-hand corner of the uh, screen there that's flashing on and off right now. I'm going to hit the tune button on WSJTX and notice that I'm putting out just a touch under 50 watts here on uh, 20 meters. Now, if I go over here and I switch to 10 meters and I hit tune again, we're putting out about 10 watts. Well, what gives? I made a new profile in WSJTX, so there's no memories or anything in it. What we want to do with every band, when you, uh, especially when you initially start using WSJTX, it all has to do with this power slider right here. So what we want to do, so I'm on 10 meters right now. Notice we were only getting about 10 watts out. 
Well, if I hit this tune button, we want to pay attention to two things. We want to pay attention to the power bar and the ALC, if you have this on your radio. Uh, and if not, I'll show you a way. We want to grab this power bar and bring this up to uh, pretty much... Now we're showing pretty much the full power. We're putting out 50 watts. But notice uh, the ALC goes up if I crank this power up anymore. We don't want that. We want to bring the power bar down to where... Uh, and in the manual, if you read the manual for WSJTX, if you don't have, AT, if you don't have an ALC, just bring the power bar down until the power on the radio starts to drop a little bit, like right here. Notice there's no ALC. Our power bar is kind of dropping a little bit. That is the perfect place to have your settings. And now we're putting out 50 watts on 10 meters. And if we go back to 20 meters where we just were, you'll notice I had a little bit of ALC. So I want to grab this power bar. I can actually bring it up a little bit and then start bringing it down. And again, no ALC, the power meter is just kind of starting to go down. That's the perfect place. And whatever your antenna is resonant for, I would recommend just going through all the bands. So now we're on 12 meters. Let's take a look. We got a lot of ALC there. So let's bring the power meter down, bring it back up here. So we're kind of getting rid of that ALC and our, and our power meter just kind of tickles going down. Once you have those set, uh, you can pretty much go back and forth to any band. So we were on 20. I can just quick click there. Now it's set 50 watts roughly, no ALC. Let's go back to 10 meters. Everything's good there. And uh, we'll go back to hit on tune. And then we'll go to 12 meters. And everything is good there. I might have to touch up this ALC a little bit. Just mind this power bar. Mind the power, mind the ALC. So now let's say something's really out of whack. I'm going to go to 40 meters and I'm just going to crank this slider up. Uh, and we're, we'll hit tune. And let's see here. We no notice we get all kinds of ALC. Even though this slider here is way the heck up there and it's really nasty on 40 meters, I'm just doing this for an example. If we go back to 20 meters, it keeps the settings. Even though this slider didn't change, which would be neat if it did, when we hit tune, we're still good to go there. So you might not have tuned that particular band uh, with your power slider. So, and again, we can go back to 10 meters. Everything is good there. But if we go back to 40 meters, we'll see that it's all janked up again. So we just have to mind our power slider and bring that back down into uh, where it should be good. So I hope that answers your question. That is most likely the problem with it. And uh, uh, thanks for writing in. That is that is a good question. And everybody, please mind your power slider. If you're overdriving, when your ALC is really high, you're going to be splattering. You're going to be causing interference. It takes three seconds to just hit that tune button, pull that slider down, and kind of just make sure you're putting out a clean signal. Please, for the love of God, be a good amateur radio operator. <laughs> Uh, guys, thanks so much for watching. Again, if you have questions for me, shoot me an email, k8mrd at iCloud.com. If you'd like to support the channel, you can head over to patreon.com slash k8mrd radio stuff. You can also follow me on Twitter for some random posts of cool ham-related things. So <laughs> in, the in the meantime, thanks again for watching another episode of k8mrd radio stuff. 73, guys.